Hey there, my name is Matt Finkenbinder. I'm a geologist and professor at Wilkes University. And I want to welcome you to this lecture, uh, which is part of the Oxygen Isotopes in Lakes lecture series, uh, written by myself and Jonathan Dean of the University of Hull. And this lecture, uh, lecture two, is focused on understanding water stable isotopes. Topics that we'll cover in this lecture include, first off, a review of uh, hydrogen and also oxygen isotopes and their relative abundance. And we'll then look at uh, how those two isotopes will combine to form different varieties of water molecules, which we call isotope, um, isotope molecules or isotope logs. We'll then briefly review the hydrologic cycle or the water cycle and talk about the reservoirs and fluxes. And then last, we'll have a, a pretty lengthy discussion on the various controls on the spatial and uh, temporal variations in precipitation isotope values. And so in short, what we want to try to answer here is how and why does the isotopic composition of precipitation vary across the Earth over space and time? Okay, so at the outset, we want to talk about uh, the basics of uh, the abundance of these various isotopes. <clears throat> so obviously, when we're talking about water, we're talking about hydrogen and oxygen isotopes. What's shown here on the screen is the average abundance of hydrogen and oxygen isotopes in atom percent in the Earth system. <clears throat> so at the outset, we'll talk about oxygen isotopes. We've got three stable oxygen isotopes. First, there's oxygen-16, which consists of eight protons and eight neutrons, by far and away, and this is the most abundant variety of oxygen. And over 99.7% um, of oxygen in the Earth is this particular variety. Then we have uh, two much less common varieties, oxygen-17, which is eight protons, but nine neutrons. You can see it's very low abundance here, less than 0.03%. And then we've got oxygen 18, and this one is uh, this one consists of eight protons but 10 neutrons. So this is the heaviest variety. <clears throat> and uh, this particular isotope uh, consists uh, or makes up about 0.2% of all oxygen in the Earth system. Then we've got two stable hydrogen isotopes. <clears throat> First off, uh, hydrogen 1, which is also called protium. So hydrogen 1 consists of just one proton. And this is, again, by far and away the most abundant. Over 99.98% of all hydrogen is this particular variety. <clears throat> but then we have this other variety, which uh, is hydrogen-2. Uh, here, this is abbreviated as a D, because this is known as deuterium. <clears throat> and deuterium is much less abundant at uh, less than 0.01%. Okay, so following up on this then, now we're going to talk about water isotope molecules and their abundance. <clears throat> so we know that the uh, chemical formula of water is H2O, and so we can have all different <clears throat> varieties or combinations of those stable isotopes to produce uh, different uh, water isotope molecules or isotopomers or isotopologs. <clears throat> the ones here that are shown in bold are the most abundant and the most important for paleoclimate studies. So first we've got H2-16O, um, that consists of two units of protium and then just one unit of oxygen-16. This is by far and away the most abundant. Uh, we can see here 99.7% of all water molecules consist of this combination. <clears throat> then we have the second most abundant and that's uh, H2-18O, and so two units of protium and then we have this uh, oxygen-18. That's about 0.2%. Then we have h 2 which is less than 0.037%. And then last, we have this combination that consists of one protium, one deuterium, and oxygen-16, and that's about 0.03%. All of the other <coughs> combinations, or water isotope logs, are, are just much less abundant in the Earth's system. And so because of that, uh, we're going to focus just on the two most abundant molecules here in this lecture, oxygen um, H2-16O and H2-18O. <clears throat> okay, so now we wanna talk about the water cycle. So and the cover slide here shows a conceptual diagram of the water cycle. And this is this dynamic cycle. Water is constantly being moved between 
a series of <clears throat> major reservoirs or storages, and then it's moving in between those through a series of fluxes. The major reservoirs here that uh, we see in the water cycle in your system are first off the oceans. I think we all know that the oceans contain the vast majority of water in the earth. Then we've got uh, water in the atmosphere, water vapor. <clears throat> we've got then with precipitation, then we've got uh, you know, liquid water falling to the surface. And so we've got water contained in rivers and lakes. <clears throat> There's also a good amount of water <clears throat> in the cryosphere. And so that would be stored up in uh, glaciers, ice sheets, and snowfields. And then last, some of that water will <clears throat> infiltrate at the surface into the soil and become uh, what we call groundwater. And so those are the five major uh, reservoirs or stores. And now we'll talk about the processes or fluxes that move water between those reservoirs. First, we'll talk about evaporation. So that would uh, initiate primarily from the oceans and surface waters and transfer water from those uh, reservoirs up to the atmosphere. And then we have condensation, which happens in clouds and when air masses rise and the atmosphere cools. That causes saturation and therefore condensation, which is the phase change from vapor to liquid, and that results in precipitation. On the surface of the earth, then, we have runoff from precipitation. We can then have evapotranspiration, which is the loss of water from plants and soils back up to the atmosphere. And then we can also have the process of infiltration, which is the vertical downward movement of water from the surface into the groundwater. And all of this, uh, all of these fluxes are powered by energy from the sun, which uh, ultimately sets in motion the first uh, flux, which is evaporation, primarily happening from the oceans. <clears throat> okay, so continuing on this discussion, we'll talk briefly now <clears throat> about uh, you know the amount of water that's stored in the uh, overall fluxes. So this box diagram here is showing again the primary reservoirs of water and also the transfer fluxes. In addition to that, you'll note that we see those delta 18O values. <clears throat> and so recall from the previous lecture that a delta 18O value is the way that we reference the oxygen isotopic composition of water. <clears throat> and that's a function of the ratio of the heavy isotope divided by the light isotope <clears throat> normalized to a reference standard. And so this uh, is really helpful because it shows us and it tells us not only the amount of water that's stored and it's moving between reservoirs, but also it gives us an idea of the representative or average delta 18 value of that water. <clears throat> Note first off that the isotopic composition of water in the various reservoirs is substantially different. <clears throat> and a major reason for this is the process of fractionation. Um, again, recall from the previous or the first lecture that fractionation is this uh, physical process um, whereby the relative abundance of isotopes changes between the products and the reactants of a phase change. And so from one reservoir to another, we see differences in the delta 18 O values. And uh, primarily, this is due to mass differences in those water isotope alongs. Best examples of this for us in the context of our discussion is evaporation and condensation. And so when we think about evaporation, we'll start with the ocean. We can see that the ocean here has a delta 18 O value of 0.0, .0 per mil. <coughs> Excuse me. And then uh, we have the process of evaporation. And note here that the delta 18 O value of the evaporated uh, water vapor is more negative, and it's negative 6 per mil. The reason for that is that uh, the lighter isotope log, H216O, is uh, much easier to evaporate because it's just simply a lighter mass or a lower mass. And that causes preferential uptake of the H216O molecule at the expense of H218O when we go from a liquid to a vapor. And the counterexample to this is condensation, which takes place in clouds. And so if we look at the uh, box that's labeled atmosphere over the continents, we can see that we have a representative delta 18 O value here of vapor of negative 20 plus or minus 10 per mil. And then we have precipitation. And note how the precipitation here is negative 7.5 per mil. And so in this case, the uh, uh, precipitated water 
is actually more heavy because it's moving towards the zero value. And so another example here of fractionation, when an air mass cools and condenses, it will undergo, oh, it will we'll cause this phase transformation. And the heavier water isotope molecule, H2A-tino, will more preferentially condense to form rainfall. And therefore, that results in a heavier or more positive delta A tino value of the precipitation in comparison to the vapor source. <clears throat> okay, so for the rest of this lecture, what we want to do is talk about the various controls um, that help explain um, why the uh, oxygen isotopic or the hydrogen isotopic composition of uh, precipitation varies across space and time. A great way to visualize this is through this GIF right here. This shows the seasonal changes in the uh, precipitation delta 18 O values. We'll play this again. It, uh, it uh, goes through pretty fast, begins in January, and then it uh, runs through the seasonal cycle and then ends in December. And so I'll play this twice. And what we want to think about is um, well, we want to make some observations, look carefully at how the values change across space and also time, and then think about uh, what controls might be important to help explain again the spatial and temporal uh, variations in precipitation delta T null values. <clears throat> So I think one of the most obvious things is that we see this apparent latitudinal shifting where the colors, in this case, uh, you know, indicative of the isotope values based on the scale, are moving up and down across the seasonal cycle. Note also that we see the bluest colors here indicating the most negative um, oxygen isotope values at the poles. And we also see counter to that the most yellow or the most positive values near the low latitudes. Okay, so now that we've looked at that, we're going to jump into a discussion of the various controls. So, we're talking about precipitation isotopes, either the uh, oxygen isotopes or the hydrogen isotopes in rainfall or snow. Then we have to consider these factors shown here. So, we're going to talk about the moisture source, and this refers to the part of the ocean where water evaporates to form vapor. Next, we've got temperature, pretty straightforward. Uh, the degree of continentality is number three. And what I mean by that is, uh, is the location, is the landmass maritime very close to the ocean? Or counter to that, is it quite distant? Uh, for example, um, are we talking about a location that's uh, smack dab in the middle of a major landmass? Number three is uh, seasonality. And so what I mean by this is, uh, when does it rain? Uh, many places on Earth have a very seasonal uh, distribution of precipitation. For example, in monsoonal impacted regions. And in those locations, they might have um, the vast majority of precipitation occurring in the summer and not that much in the winter. If that changes due to climate change, that can result in a big shift in the isotopic composition of rainfall. And then last number five is the amount of precipitation. Um, this is important only in the low latitudes in the tropics. And we'll talk about each of these individually uh, next in the lecture. Okay, so first we'll talk about the uh, moisture source of precipitation. And the map here is a, a map uh, developed by NASA scientists and it shows the uh, oxygen isotopic composition, or the delta ATNO o value of surface ocean water. <clears throat> and uh, note here that we've got some pretty big uh, variability. <clears throat> the scale is on the bottom, and we can see that we've got values that are <clears throat> plus zero or positive um, into the oranges and reds. <clears throat> and then we have uh, in the blues and purples more negative values. The point here is that uh, the moisture source, or really the place in the oceans where the moisture is evaporated, is an important first order control 
on the uh, vapor itself, and therefore the delta ATNO value of precipitation that falls at any given location on Earth's surface. In addition to this, if we have changes in the source um, that might uh, happen over seasonal timescales or with shifts in atmospheric circulation due to climate change, then that will result in shifting or changing the source, and therefore that would um, end up impacting, again, the precipitation isotope values. <clears throat> Number two is atmospheric temperature. Um, the first off, we'll look at the plot here. And so um, on the right hand side, we see we've got this pie plot that shows the uh, annual air temperature in the x axis. And then we've got the um, oxygen isotopic composition of precipitation in the y axis. <clears throat> this is a compilation of uh, precipitation samples that were collected from um, a large latitudinal gradient going from the North Pole and South Pole and then moving into the mid-latitudes and then uh, towards the equator. <clears throat> and you can see, I think there's a pretty good fit. And so if we add a best fit line to this, this demonstrates that primarily outside the tropics, the delta 18 value of precipitation is highly correlated with surface air temperature. And the way it works <clears throat> is that we have higher delta 18 values where we have warm temperatures <clears throat> and vice versa with cold temperatures. Now, when we add a best fit line to this and all this surface data, uh, we have this global average relationship, uh, which amounts to about an uh, increase of uh, 0.69 per mil of oxygen isotopes for each uh, one degree C of warming at the surface. And so temperature is absolutely a dominant first order control, uh, but importantly, outside the tropics uh, in the mid latitudes and the high latitudes. <clears throat> okay, number three. This one is perhaps the most difficult to explain. Um, <clears throat> what we're going to talk about here is uh, the processes of air mass rain out, uh, something called distillation. <clears throat> and now ultimately that's related to the degree of transport from the vapor source to the site of precipitation. <clears throat> and ultimately that's related to the degree of continentality. And again, what I mean by that is, uh, is it a maritime location very close to the ocean source? Or are we talking about a site that's, let's say a thousand kilometers from the ocean, smack dab in the middle of a continent? <clears throat> okay, so the graphic here shows a, a hypothetical coastal region <clears throat> that experiences multiple rain out events. First, we have uh, evaporation from the oceans. <coughs> Excuse me. And that produces uh, what I'll call our original vapor. And we can see here that the original vapor has a uh, delta 18 value of negative 13 per mil. <clears throat> so then we have an air mass moving over land um, because of uplift, it probably ends up cooling and that causes precipitation. When this happens, <clears throat> again, we have the uh, heavier isotope molecules, h 2 preferentially condensing to form precipitation that results in fractionation <clears throat> and therefore, the uh, isotopic composition of the precipitation is different than the vapor. And in particular, in this case, it's always gonna be more positive uh, in comparison to the vapor. And so the first rain here has a value of negative three per mil. Now, when that happens, the residual vapor will also be different because of the loss of some of those heavier water isotope molecules. So note now here that we have a second vapor and that has a uh, isotope composition of negative 15 per mil. And now with further cooling and transport distance over land, for example, this mountain belt, then we have the second rain out event. And again, we've got preferential condensation of the heavier H2A-T-N-O, and that results in fractionation, and therefore a uh, second precipitation, which is characterized by, in this case, a heavier isotope value. Uh, but note that it's a bit more negative or lighter in comparison to that first uh, rain out event. And again, then we have a second vapor, which is left over from that. The point of all of this is that this process of progressive rain out occurs with increasing transport distance from the ocean source. And again, we've uh, uh, discussed that the H2A-T-N-O, because it's heavier, preferentially condenses more easily than H2A-T-N-O, 
And so and with successive rain out and this process of distillation, then we have air masses evolving with transport. <clears throat> and in the end, this produces isotopically lighter <clears throat> or more negative precipitation isotope values with transports. Um, again, moving from a maritime location and then kind of progressing towards the interior portion of a continent. <clears throat> okay, making progress. So number four, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about the seasonality of precipitation. And so what we're looking at here is a plot that shows the mean monthly delta 18 value of precipitation plotted by month in the x-axis for a Canadian network of isotopes and precipitation sites at a place called Bay de Spore in Newfoundland, which is in eastern Canada. And this is a 14-year compilation to calculate these averages. So in the um, mid to high latitudes, this is a, a quite important control. And this is mainly linked to the seasonal differences in atmospheric temperature. And so the summer precipitation delta values are uh, heavier or more positive. And then you can see that we've got this kind of bell curve shape where then in the um, you know, winter months, for example, one or two, January, February, and then 11 and 12, November, December, we can see that those in turn are a bit uh, more negative or light. So good example here again of how atmospheric temperature in turn controls the seasonal isotopic composition of precipitation again, primarily outside the tropics. <clears throat> okay, and our, our fifth and our final control that we'll talk about here is uh, referring to the amount of precipitation at that particular location. And this, it turns out, is a dominant control. It's a very important control um, in and around the equator and in the subtropics. And in particular, it's quite important in regions influenced by uh, major uh, monsoonal climates. For example, places like uh, the Amazon basin or um, India or uh, in China uh, for the East Asian monsoon. So well, the plot here is showing the relationship between the amount of precipitation on an event scale in the x-axis plotted versus the delta 18 value in the y-axis. And note here that those two are inversely related. And so a high amount of precipitation results in a more negative delta value and vice versa. And so we can add a best fit line to this and we can see that in this case, in and around the equator in the tropics, the delta 18 of value of precipitation is uh, nicely correlated with the amount of precipitation. And so where we have more rainfall or a higher rainfall amount, and that results in a lighter or more negative uh, delta 18 of value of rain at that location. And primarily this is related to fractionation. And again, the fact that the heavier H2-18O will preferentially condense more easily than H2-16O. And so during an individual discrete precipitation event, um, if that lasts for a long period of time, let's say several days, early on the heavier uh, H2-18O will condense. And so with increasing precipitation, more and more of that ends up precipitating out. And so what's left over near the end of the event is um, a water sample that has um, a lot more H2-16O compared to H2-18O because the heavier water has already precipitated out previously. Okay, and so that's it for our second lecture focused on water isotopes. Here's a series of summary questions. Um, if you can, you know, reflect and think uh, back and answer these questions, then you'll really um, understand uh, the big conceptual topics that we covered here, uh, focusing on water isotopes. Okay, thanks for listening.